If you want, I'd invite you, if you want, take your Bibles or your phones or whatever you read the Bible on. If not, I'll put it on the screen. But if you want to open your Bibles to Hosea, Hosea chapter 3 is actually where we're going to be. And we'll read that here in a minute. I've entitled this message, Wrestling with God's Love. Wrestling with God's Love. A young man once wrote uh, the following to his girlfriend. And he said, sweetheart, if this world was as hot as the Sahara Desert, I would crawl on my knees through the burning sand to come to you. If the world would be like the Atlantic Ocean, I would swim through shark-infested waters to come to you. I would fight the most fiercest dragon to be by your side. And he moves on, and as the story goes, the end of the letter, he says, if it doesn't rain this Thursday, I'll see you then. <laughs> And the point of that is, if you're anything like me or the man who wrote this letter, we tend to oversell but underdeliver specifically in the context today when it comes to loving others. But God doesn't. We undersell, or we oversell, I'm sorry, and underdeliver, but God does not. In fact, 1 John. Maybe? Yes. First John uh, 4.8 says, The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And have you ever considered what love truly is? The Bible says God is love. We just saw that. He's equal to love. He's synonymous with love. But what is love? And what does that love look like? I mean, if I passed out a bunch of papers today. We all independently wrote down what love is. I wonder how many definitions we'd get. What if we did that to like everyone in the Four Corners area and you, you keep going out? We get a lot of different definitions and thoughts. But the Bible has specific definition of what love is and who God is. And in short summary, the Bible teaches that God's love is unmerited. God died for me. And if you're a believer, God died for you. And he chose us, as Tony preached a few weeks ago in Ephesians 1 language, while we were still God's enemy. All believers hated God and were, and we'll hear this soon in Ephesians, children of wrath. But Jesus died for us to provide that way of escape that we needed, to make us adopted children of him. With that in mind, I want us to look at the book of Hosea today. And again, we'll be in chapter 3 in a minute. And let me summarize the background and what's happening. Because maybe you're familiar with Hosea, maybe you're not. Um, it's no problem if you're not, not. Let me try to summarize what's happening. We have a man, his name is Hosea. He's instructed by God to take a wife. And it's, it sounds a little strange to us, but this is what happened. He's instructed to take a wife whose name is Gomer. Now, in the, play, in the culture that, that they live, it was not uncommon for a woman to be a prostitute. Gomer was a prostitute. And even after they're married, she continues in this immoral lifestyle. Because of God's instructions to Hosea, Hosea remained committed to love his wife regardless of her actions and what was happening. At one point, you get the idea, and you, you'd get this from reading Hosea, it, it's so bad, it's to the point where Hosea is bringing Gomer food, and, and, and he ends up being, maybe, maybe he's downstairs, I mean, we don't, we don't know exactly how it works, but he's bringing her food, and the man who she's staying with brings the food up to her and takes credit for it, and, and essentially she's praising the provisions that she has, right? She's praising the provisions that she's getting that's being provided by the man who she's, who she's staying with who essentially was really provided by her husband. That's kind of the story that God is presenting in Hosea of what's going on with him and his people and the relationship that's going on at the time. And things come to a climax. She hits rock bottom, sold as a slave. And despite all this, her husband, and this would be the idea, and this is the idea of redemption, right? Her husband go, would go to the slave market to actually purchase back his own wife takes her in and makes it right. And maybe you've guessed it. 
this story is really the story of God. Yes, Hosea is set up as a picture of God's love for us and, and an illustration and something that happens in history. Uh, but with all of that in mind, let us read together. And I want to read from Hosea 3, 1 through 5. And the Bible says this, Then the Lord said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by her husband, yet an adulteress. Even as the Lord loves the sons of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes. So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a half of barley. Then I said to her, you shall stay with me for many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man, so I will be toward you. And then in verse 4, for the sons of of Israel will remain for many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, and without ephod or household idols. Afterward, the sons of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they will come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness in the last days. At the time Hosea is written, God is just disgusted with his people. And even though you, and you, you might think, well, what were they doing? You might say, well, Jay, what, what were the people doing in this time? Why was he so upset? Were they just, were, were they following after other gods? Were they doing other things? And the answer is kind of yes. But actually, the people of his day, of Hosea's day, they did a lot of the sacrifices. They did a lot of the things that God, if you, if you read through Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, he, they did a lot of the things that God had said. And they went to service, much like we're in church. I'm not saying you shouldn't be in church. Don't take what I'm saying out of context. But what I am saying is they did a lot of those things. They were box checkers. Okay, you know what I mean by that? They would check the boxes. They kind of said, oh, well, you don't want me to do that? Okay, I'll, I'll do that. And they, they had their own thing. But they had a problem. Because all they were doing was checking boxes. But there was a love for Jesus that was lost and didn't exist. And in some ways, it really is like going to church today. Because you think, well, the good work of going to church will please God. Or the good work of giving money or the good work of whatever it might be will somehow please God. Rather than going to church, rather than serving the Lord, rather than seeking the Lord. Because you love him as a result of the gospel's work in your heart. So here's a difference there. And listen to God speaking. You can hear it from God himself who speaks in his word in Hosea 6. He says this. Therefore I have hewn them in pieces. That means cut them in pieces by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And the judgments on you are like the light that goes forth. For I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice. Do you see, you see what God's saying? He's not saying that what they're doing is wrong, right? They're doing what he's asking, but he's, he's literally saying you're sacrificing from the wrong heart. You're doing it wrong, right? He's, that's why God says, for I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice. And in knowledge of God, and knowledge in the scripture has this idea of intimacy, right? So this, this intimate knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. But like Adam, they have transgressed the covenant. There they have dealt treacher treacherously against me. And the whole point of Hosea is that in spite of the people's unfaithfulness. That should say in spite of. God is always faithful. And his love is unconditional. Amen. Right? The whole point of Hosea is that. So if you get nothing else, get this. In spite of the people's unfaithfulness. In spite of our unfaithfulness. God is always faithful. And God's love is unconditional. God says in Hosea 2.14, Therefore, behold, I will allure her. Bring her into the wilderness and speak kindly to her. Hosea 2.16 and 17 says, It will come about in that day, declares the Lord, that they will call me Ishi and no longer call me Baali. And I will remove the names of 
the Baals from her mouth so that they will be, they, they will be mentioned by their names no more. Okay? And, and Ishi is this term for salvation and Baali is like husband. It, 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 he, God's trying to express that the, there's a true relationship and intimacy that will come through salvation, right? They, they, they will call me salvation and no longer just, you know, husband which is the idea here that's being said. So in today's text, we're going to see a couple of attributes of, of God's love. And the first one that I want us to see is that God's love is forgiving. And we'll look at, we'll read here verse one in a minute. Before we get there, take, I want to take a look at Galatians 2.20. You don't not look at it. I'm just going to read quickly, so don't bother turning. You could turn there, but I'll probably be on by the time you get there. Galatians, that's why I put them on the slides. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Jesus lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who what? Who loved me and gave himself up for me. 1 John 4, 9 through 11 says, by this, the love of God was manifested. What does that mean? That the love of God was shown to us, right? That God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we, talking to believers, that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation. That means the appeasement, right? That means the thing that satisfied the payment for our sins. Verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. And often when we think or talk about forgiving love, we miss the point. I think often, and maybe I'm just speaking to myself here, but maybe one other at least here is like me. We get proud. We get arrogant. We forget or, or just don't understand how, how truly, or we forget how truly sinful and wretched. And like the people who God was disgusted with in the time of Hosea, really disgusting we truly are without the gospel, without Jesus. And many people think, well, God just forgives, right? Isn't, because, Jay, isn't, isn't God's love just bigger than my sin? I'm pretty sure I read that in the Bible somewhere. Depends what you mean. Uh, often when, you, when people speak that way, the thinking views God somehow like a weak parent or really a weak God. Or, or it's like somehow God's like the grandfather, right? Grandparents are the ones they just like, oh, okay, yeah, it's okay. Like, I never could get away with that. But, you know, the kids, yeah, no problem. You know, it's just overlook sin. But this isn't true. This isn't the love that the scripture speaks about. Every sin of all times will be paid for. It either was already paid for by Christ or will be paid for in hell and judgment for all eternity. That's not my language. That's scriptural language. As there is no amount of time we can pay to make up for our sin, only Christ, the infinite God, could do that. Let me say that one more time. Every sin of all times will be paid for. It was either already paid for by Christ or will be paid for in hellfire and judgment for all eternity as there is no amount of time which can pay, which we could pay to make up for our sin. Christ, the infinite God, could, is the only one that can do that. And when you think about it this way, think about it like they advertise water, right? The bottle is 99% pure, which is another way of saying what? It's not pure. That's right. It's a really fancy marketing ploy telling you this water is not exactly pure. And it will never be pure. Because why? It's impure. And that's our situation without Jesus. Nothing is more foreign to sinful human nature than forgiveness. And I bring this up because we're talking about God's forgiving love. Nothing is more foreign to sinful human nature than forgiveness. But on the other side, nothing is more characteristic of divine grace. And as sinful fallen people, we struggle with forgiveness. And I think that's why we struggle with who God is. Because 
all, you know, it's, it's been said before, man created, or excuse me, God created man in his own image. And ever since that time, we've been returning the favor, right? Meaning we now create God in our own image is, is where that was. Um, but for those that haven't had enough coffee yet, but <laughs> sinful fallen people, we struggle with forgiveness. Which one of us could say, you know, no, every time I'm wrong, do you know what, Jay? My first response is to just lovingly forgive the person who wronged me. Like, who here could say that? I, I'd like to tell you I could remember a time I did that. I mean, like one. I'm having, I, I don't know that I could find one if I'm honest with you. God's forgiving love seeks to hold a union together. That is what we see in this passage. That's what God's teaching his people in us using the divine illustration here that he chose to use in Hosea. And as you consider this attitude of forgiving love, think of Jesus. Think of Jesus' relationship to the church and how he repeatedly, we're the church, the people who are here, the people who are saved, right? The people who are saved in all of Four Corners, in all of Central Florida, and outside of Florida, as if such, I've heard there's other places, but in these other places, the believers that are there, that's the bride. Think of Jesus' relationship to them and how he repeatedly forgives them and never, ever, ever cast his bride away. And that's important. That should bring hope. That's why we sing. That's why we can sing. And in fact, Christ's love is what husbands should model to their wives. This is actually the point of Ephesians 5. I know it's often used like, you know, honey, look, this is what God says. You know, you, you need to listen to what I'm saying. And, you know, well, husband, look, you, you need to be loving like Jesus is to me. But there, and, and there are applications for those of us who are spouses, but the real point is about Jesus and the church. It actually says that if you read through the, the text in Ephesians 5. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be subject to their husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Okay, the real point of Ephesians, and again, I know there's application, but the real point is Jesus and his love for his bride. And there's two aspects of God's forgiving love we see in our passage. And the first aspect of God's forgiving love is that it is anchored in a covenant. And I'll explain what that means. If that sounds foreign to you, no problem. I'll get there. Uh, sometimes people use large words. They, they, they often have much simpler meanings than, than we often realize. So, but God's forgiving love is anchored in a covenant. First one in Hosea, the Lord said to me, or chapter three, verse one, the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by her husband, yet an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the sons of Israel. And that's what we get. Even as the Lord loves the sons of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes. And the command of Hosea is clear. Go, love her as God, even loves the sons of Israel. In spite of all the things that God has to say about who the sons of Israel are in Hosea, I gave you a short sampling of them, but God says things like, you nauseate me, I, you make me nauseous, you make me want to vomit. He has language like that in Hosea. Um, like literally, like please stop. I mean literally, please stop sacrificing and worshiping to me because your worship nauseates me. And yet this is what he says about his love here in this text, even as he loves them. The command of Hosea is clear. And someone here might be wondering, well, what exactly is a covenant? Okay? What exactly is a covenant? Most here might be familiar with the word testament, right? Maybe if I said Old Testament and New Testament, maybe that's something you've heard. You could think about Old Covenant and New Covenant. Basically, when we refer to something in the Old Testament or New Testament, we're making a distinction between these different main overarching relationships that God had set up and specifically Israel and, and today with us and the church and his people. Um, and you think of a covenant as, think of a covenant as an agreement between two parties. Quoting from Jeremiah, the writer of Hebrews says this. Do I have this one up here? I may not. Oh, I do. Okay. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws upon their heart and on their mind I will write them. 
He then says, in their sins, in their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. So the writer of Hebrews is reaching back to Jeremiah, who's looking forward to the time that the writer of Hebrews is now talking about that we now live in. There's a lot we can say about covenants. But for this morning, this morning, here's what I want you to get. Here's what's important. Co God's covenants are relationship-based. God's covenants are relationship-based. God's relationship with Israel was based on his covenant to them. Okay? Now, it's always dependent on God, thankfully, because could you imagine if your salvation just depended on your attitude today? How about, you know, over a week or a lifetime? I mean, we're in trouble if it depends on us, right? But God's relationship with Israel was based on his covenant to them. It's the same with Christ and us. When God first made his covenant with Abraham, it wasn't based on conditions. It was God starting a relationship that God himself would not let fail. Okay? God started a relationship in a covenant that God himself would not let fail. And think about, and if you're familiar with the scripture, think about any of the, relation, the covenants God made. Adam. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, David, Israel, us, all failures. But God's not. God's faithful anyway. And they're all based on relationships that God has with the other member. And consider this. Isn't this the reason that Jesus died? To fulfill all of those covenantal relationships, all of those agreements that God made, dating all the way back to Adam, by the way, right after sin, God comes and says, yeah, the time's coming when I'm going to fix this. I mean, in short summary, that's called the first gospel. It's Genesis 3.15, if you wanted to write that down or look it up sometime. But that's why that's called the first gospel. Because as soon as sin came and death came, God came and promised that he was going to fix it. That the Messiah would come. And, and we see that, that story unfold more and more and more and more. And then look back on with even more clarity as we look back on it. The gospel. Bible has one message. It has one story. That's it. It really does. It seems like it's a whole bunch of different stuff, but it's not. The Bible has a single message from Genesis to Revelation. Singular, Revelation. And it's all about Jesus. It starts there and it ends with the revelation of what? The revelation of Jesus. This is actually what that is being spoken of there. God's forgiving love is anchored in a covenant. Not only is God's forgiving love anchored in a covenant, but it's independent of circumstances. We could say this, it's independent of our own merit. Meaning it's, it's not because I deserve it. That's what we mean by that. Look again at verse 1. To love the sons of Israel, though, or even though, they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes. We turn to other gods. We may not turn to them and you may not have statues in your house that you're turning to to ask for food. But, but we have our gods and our other things or raisin cakes, if you would, that we turn to. And God is talking about his love for Israel even though they turn to other God and raisin cakes. And, and you don't have to get lost in the raisin cakes. You could look them up, but I can help you. They're, they were essentially little delicacies that, uh, would be the, that were employed in uh, Baal, or maybe you've heard Baal worship, uh, depending if you want the Hebrew or Greek uh, transliteration. But in, in Baal worship, they were these little cakes that they would enjoy and they were part of worship to him. So it's, it's this idea of adultery on God, right? It's this idea of serving other things. We have, those God, we have those gods as well. The cakes are a picture of sensuality and lust. In peril, it's parallel in thought with Gomer being the adulteress, right? Jose has this whole like parallel in thought of what's happening. And often people base their love off of feelings. Often we base our love off selfish desires and motives. Right? I love you as long as what? You love me. Right? That's how that works. I love you for loving me. And you think about how all that works, right? And the chicken and the egg, and it's, it's bad. Listen to what some of the top definitions of love are, according to Google. Right? Google is our, we don't have dictionaries anymore. We don't have encyclopedias. We just have Google. Right? So... Google, if it's written, it must be true. Google are, 
except, of course, the one thing that is written is true. Then they say that one's not true. But everything else that's written is true, apparently. But some of the top definitions on Google for love are a strong, positive emotion of regard and affection. An object of warm affection or devotion, whatever any of that means. Or as a verb, have a great affection or liking for, to get pleasure from. And it shouldn't be surprising to understand this when you think about how we use the word in today's language. And we say things like, and English is the worst, right? English is if you speak any other language, um, much to Tony's sadness, he doesn't speak Spanish. He still speaks Spanish. You guys know I've been in Miami for like decades. I come up here and, you know, my Cuban friend doesn't speak Spanish. I don't know what's happening. Um, but if you've lived in Miami, that, that, you know, I've, I've been down there for years. But anyway, if you spoke Spanish, you'd understand English is just awful at communicating emotion, affection of any kind, right? I mean, because we love our wife. We love God. We love pizza. We love our dog. We love... I love the New York Jets, but whoever you might love, I know, it's awful, it's bad. See, that was meant to generate sympathy, not, not, not ridicule. But, not that it's bad for us to use love for any of these things, but none of them explain love from the biblical viewpoint. It's like saying, it's like the old saying, Trust is something you earn, and often we treat love the same way. How about this expression? Well, you know, I've fallen into love with so-and-so, which if I can fall into love, then I can fall what? Out of love. Out of love. But that's, and, when we, and, and my point is to talk about God. God doesn't fall out of love with us. It doesn't work that way. And sometimes when we view God, we view him wrong because we view him, again, God created man in his own image, We've been returning the favor ever since. So often we, we ascribe, when we read God's love, we ascribe it like how we do it. But we do it wrong. And more importantly is, what do you think of when you think of love, when you think of God's love for his people? Well, it shouldn't be what we were talking about when we say we love pizza. You know, because some days I don't feel like, well, I always feel like pizza. But apparently there are people who could get sick of it. That's what I've heard. And God's, Forgiving love is not based on any type of merit. God's forgiving love is not based on any type of merit. God's love for people is based on a decision that he made. Why did God choose Abraham? Because of how great Abraham was? No, if you're familiar with anything of what's happening there, I mean, this guy was an absolute pagan. Absolute pagan. Why did God choose Israel? Not because there was anything good about him. In fact, if you're familiar with Deuteronomy, there's actually a section in there where God literally says, I chose you because you were the worst. I'm summing it up. But God literally says, I chose you because you were the smallest, you were the most uneducated, you were the worst, and the one no one would have expected to be successful. That's why I chose you. That's what he tells the people of Israel. Proud Israel, God says that about them. Why did God choose the members of C3 that are here today who are saved? Why did he choose you for salvation? God didn't save us because of anything we've done. And in a couple of weeks in Ephesians, we're going to see this. Ephesians 2, 1 through 4 says this. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. What can a dead person do? Nothing. The real walking dead is Ephesians 2, 1. But, and, the, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of de disobedience. Among them too, all, funny little words in the Bible. What does all mean? All. Formerly lived in the lusts of our own flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, just in case you didn't get it, the text says, were by nature children of wrath even as everyone else. God saved us because he loved us. And his love for us is the decision that he chose to make. Do we deserve God's love? No. If you, de if you deserve God's love, let's talk. Talk to me afterward because I'd like to talk to you. I don't mean that in a bad way. I think that's a great conversation. We deserve to be cast away from a holy God. We deserve to be cast away because he's righteous. And we deserve to be thrown into the deepest pits of, of hell. Our, that's what we deserve. 
right? James 2.10 says that. You can write that down and look it up if you don't know that one. That one's a good one. But God has given us the opposite. God's forgiven love is not based on merit. There's nothing one can do to destroy that love once God has made that decision. As believers, we are secure in the love of God. This is something that should comfort your heart. Not only does God show us, and this one will be quicker, I promise, his forgiving love in this passage, but he also shows us his redeeming love. In verse 2 and 3 say this, So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a half of barley. And then I said to her, You shall stay with me for many days. You shall not play to harlot, nor shall you have a man. So I will be toward you. And the word redeemed carries the idea of a slave standing on the trader's auction block, being offered to the highest bidder, right? Because they sold people and people like Gomer in these days. They were property. At last, the price is paid by the compassionate new owner. Because this is the story. So the new owner comes, pays the price, offers the loving bond servant for, for life, uh, uh, his life to be, his rede or, or to be the redeemer because he sets this slave that he just bought free. Okay, so he, he buys a slave, sets the slave free, and this is where we get the idea of redemption, except the, the story doesn't end there. The story is now the slave says, look, you know, I'm, I'm committed to you. I'm here. And there's a love that exists. And, and, and in a small way, every metaphor and every illustration break down, right? They're trying to explain the love of God. Good, good luck. Trying to explain the depth of God, the infinitude, to use Tony, uh, Tony's message from a number of weeks ago, the infinitude of God, who can, who can explain the infinite, right? I mean, how, how, can, how can you talk about that? And that's what we get when we try to talk about redemption. But we see two aspects in this passage of God's redeeming love. I think I lost a slide there, uh, which is funny because I got picked on for having too many slides and I think I lost one. But <laughs> the first is that it's costly. God's redeeming love is costly. You've probably heard the expression that nothing in life is free. If you have children, maybe you've told this to them, right? Can I have? Can I have? Can I have? Look, you know, money doesn't grow on trees. Nothing in life is free. And when dealing with sin and our relationship before God, it's definitely true. I talked about this before. Is there any sin ever committed by anyone that will go unpunished, saved or not? The answer is no. Ezekiel 18 says this. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins will die. And you look again at our text. It says, so I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a half of barley. And just to sum it all up, well, how much did Jose pay? Hosea have to pay to get his wife off the slave market? We don't really know. Some people say, oh, it's the price of a slave and the 30 pieces of silver. And of course, they relate that to Judas and the whole thing, maybe. And there's another thought where people say, well, Hosea had to scrape all the money together. And that's the context here, right? He had to scrape everything he had to get her. That, that's what would happen in Hollywood. It's possible. Um, but it's, some of those are actually kind of missing the point. The point is God, God has an infinite amount anyway. So when we talk about God, it's not like God's bank account has any limits. Okay, just saying, doesn't. But 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. And what's the encouragement? Yeah, honor the Lord. Why? Because you've been bought with a price. Redemption is costly. Maybe not us. Though there is a cost for us as well, but in the context that I'm talking about, what was paid for our sin, that was paid for by God. And there, the, the scripture is clear about that. That the love of God, the Father who gives his only begotten Son. And this is the attitude that drives, that as First Thessalonians encourages us, if we're believers, to pray at all times. That's where we can fulfill that. That's the attitude that can drive uh, Corinth, Corinthians 10.31 that says whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do to do all for the glory of God. Amen. Not only, I'm lost up there, not only is redeeming love costly, but redeeming love causes change. Oh look, there I am. So, verse 3, then I said to her, you shall stay with me for many days. You shall not play to harlot, nor shall you have a man, so I will also be towards you. Gomer's sin caught up to her. 
But because of Hosea's love for his wife and the command of God, Hosea went and redeemed her from the slave market. He purchased her back. Think about that. God is, the picture of God is Hosea. Yes, every illustration breaks down. Every metaphor breaks down. We're Gomer. Hosea now gives his redeemed wife three commands. Stay with me. Don't play to harlot. And don't have relations with anyone else. As far as we know from this point on, Gomer is a changed woman. And the text would point us to the fact that Gomer loved Hosea, Hosea from this point. You see it in verse 5. Afterward, the sons of Israel will return, to the, the, will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And they will come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness in the last days. True redemption causes change. When God exercises his redeeming love on us, our lives change. Again, we're Gomer. We're the adulterers that are running around on God. But God offers forgiveness. He offers salvation. He offers a better way. This doesn't happen because of anything that's good about us, but because of how gracious God is and the work that he's done in our heart. And the Bible talks about this, right? And, and just real quickly, the Bible talks about past salvation, right? It talks about like when we were saved. And it talks about the present salvation, Bible language, the, the salvation that we have today. And then in Peter, it talks about that future salvation we wait for. And that time when our flesh, when sin itself will be swallowed up and thrown in to the abyss or into the pits of hell and gone. And that's the day that we look forward to. And in summary and conclusion, as we develop an understanding of God's love, remember, God's forgiving love is anchored in a covenant. This covenant is independent of circumstances. God's redeeming love, when he bought us back, it's costly. Jesus paid that price. And you know what it does? It causes change in us. There's an encouragement that the scripture says to be what we are. When we get to Ephesians 4 through 6, I don't know how Tony will handle it. Um, I'm sure he'll handle it well. I don't mean that in any bad way. That was not backhanded in any way, shape, or form. I usually say what I mean. So not backhanded anyway. But the summary of Ephesians 4 through 6 is like God saved you and did everything for you. Just be what you are. So you can still preach through it. But that's the, that's the summary of what's happening there. As, <laughs> as we go through our week this week, let's remember to thank God for his forgiving love. Thank God for his redeeming love. Ask him to enable you to submit so that you can anchor yourself in God and God's great and awesome love. Look, if you're here today and you're like, Jay, this is new to me and... I don't know if I'm saved. Like, I don't know. If I were to die today, I don't know if, what would happen to me. I'm not really sure what the gospel is. And, and, or I don't believe in the gospel. I'd love to talk to you afterward. I'm sure Tony would love to talk to you afterward. Um, all I could do is sit with you and show you what God says. Right? I can't save you. Tony can't save you. I can't counsel you into the kingdom. And Tony can't counsel you into the kingdom. What we can do is show you what God says. And, and what the real entrance into the kingdom is. And the Bible's clear about that. One way... One road, one gate, one path, however, one salvation, one name, however you want to say it. The Bible says all those different ways of saying Jesus is that way. And of course, all things point to Jesus. He is the whole point to Isaiah. It's in him that we see God's forgiving love. And God's people said, amen. All right. I wasn't sure. He doesn't ever do that. I used to always say that when I preach. I was like, I wonder if they're going to say amen. Because if not, it's going to be awkward. Um, but I figured I'd roll with it anyway. So these are things people think about when they write notes. If you've never done something like that, I'm like, what if they don't say it? What am I going to say? <laughs> so I was just going to tell you, this is the part where you say. No. <laughs> so, all right. Let us pray and then we'll enter into a time of communion. Father, you are a good God. Father, we are so thankful for your love, for your forgiveness, for giving your only son, Lord Jesus, for dying for us. We're praying right now, Father, about things we don't even grasp the depth of. And we know that. We know enough to know we cannot fully understand these things. And your love is so beyond what, and certainly I'm not a great preacher, but what the best preacher would be able to preach on. Father, as others have written, and the old song says, if the entire ocean 
were ink and the, all of the sky parchment, we could not write about your love. We would run out of ink and we would run out of sky to write on. Father, and it's so immense and infinite as we've learned in these previous weeks. We thank you for that. We thank you for grace. We thank you for salvation. Father, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, we pray that you would save them. Give them faith. Um, saving faith. And Lord, would you use us as uh, instruments to bring the gospel to our family, our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, each other. Father, we all need the gospel as your people. We know that too. And we pray for us as well. But would you use us as instruments to bring and tell others about your forgiving, redeeming love. And Father, how you gave your only son and Lord Jesus, how you died for all of those who would come. You said you turned none away. And we are so thankful for that. And we are so thankful that you didn't turn us away when we came and that you've saved us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.